Okay, go ahead. A very warm welcome to all our enthusiastic participants joining us today from across time zones. My name is Shivanshi Asthana and I will be your host for the session. For all our new participants joining us today, Five Elements Sustainable Development Group is a consultancy and a collaborative network of institutional and individual partners committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Under the mentorship, uh, mentorship of our chairman, Mr. Arun Amritam, we are on a mission to foster collaboration and consummate synergies to achieve impact at the nexus of smart cities and affordable housing, renewable energies, essential technologies for development, impact finance and consulting and mentorship. The Gender Justice India webinar series is brought to you by Five Elements SDG, where we bring on thought leaders, entrepreneurs, policy practitioners and subject matter experts from around the world to engage with and discuss a plethora of issues related to the gendered nature of society, polity, culture and economy. Before I introduce our esteemed guest for the evening, let me humbly reiterate a few house rules. Respected participants are requested to keep their microphones muted and are encouraged to type in the comments and questions in the chat box. We are streaming live on YouTube as well. And hence questions will be picked up from the chat box there in addition to our Zoom event here. Please feel free to direct your questions on the platform you're watching this and we shall take them up during the Q&A session. For discussing the very crucial topic of bridging the gender gap in political representation in India, we are very kindly joined today by Kangshi Agarwal, founder of Venetri Foundation. Kangshi is an electrical and electronics engineer and an alumnus of Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, where she studied urban policy and governance. Hers is India's first women's political uh, incubator. Netri Foundation is India's first non-partisan uh, incubator and aggregator for women in Indian politics delivering programs to create future female leaders with the imagination and determination to transform Indian pol politics and governance. Netri is incubated by IM Bangalore NSRCEL program and helps women train, upskill and run for elections at various levels of the government. Netri aims to achieve women's full and effective participation with equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, social and public life. She is a passionate community builder, political organizer, and curriculum developer, and has previously worked with a plethora of government and non-government organizations, including the Office of the Member of Parliament and Center for Policy Research. Her diverse and varied interests include regulatory frameworks, data governance, big tech, privacy, and diversity in tech. It is an honor to host you, Kangshi. Delighted that you're here. Uh, the floor is yours. Welcome to share your screen. Thank you so much, uh, Shivanshi and Five Elements for hosting me today because uh, this comes from a very personal space of uh, living gender in this country. And we have always, and uh, in so many platforms, when we talk about the gender issues, they cut across so many you know, dimensions and sectors, like right from education to health to uh, pay gap, there is uh, di about dignity of labor to domestic violence. But at the same time, there is a question that we are bothered by constantly that where are women in leadership? And when we talk about leadership, we also see a lot of funneling happen. Uh, when women enter the system, they, are, they constitute, say, 70% of the workforce anywhere across sectors. But this funneling leads to the fact that, you know, there are not so many women when it comes to the top position. Indian politics is no different. Um, and uh, from my experience of working with uh, non-government organizations, uh, Office of Member of Parliament, uh, when uh, it was, I'll take you back uh, for a moment to 2018 and 19, when I was a part of the general elections and doing political strategies and policy research. Uh, the, the, the moment when it comes to you that there, there are ripples, when you see that there are some taxes being imposed on women's sanitary napkin, which you think are so unjustified, and then you go back and do the research and see that the GST council does not even have a woman on the table. So the kind of um, policy making that happens in the country with lack of representation of diverse groups, it's the intersectional now, representation that one seeks to have, right, from caste minorities to gender, religion, uh, regions, languages, 
also there are some different kind of diversities that we have not really included in our decision making that was one but the second one is when you are in the political space and you see that the space is swarmed by men how can women really be comfortable and definitely after 75 years of independence the question arises where are we in terms of representation i will take a moment to share my screen uh and start the conversation on uh you know there is always this question that we as a country where do we aspire to be um we have uh, not looked on uh, not not only the current leaders but also in past we have heard uh, heard about this you know the idea of independence and where we must go as a democratic country in last 70 years the idea of development has also changed over the period of time but when we think about world dominance right or or saying that you know we are we want to become one of the finest countries in the world we want to be top uh leaders in the in the world we want to be the best negotiators on most international platforms the bilateral relationships uh we want to be a 5 trillion economy but how are we going to really achieve that uh when we are going to be 122 on gender inequality index or we are going to keep sliding on the gender parameters uh we look at uh, the problem of uh, you know uh, uh when we i specifically want to talk about say women's labor force participation it has gone down from uh, 34% to 22 close to 22 23% covid the way it impacted women their participation again and the even the you know the pay gaps have been largely increasing uh, increasing instead of decreasing but then we ask you know the question is that uh what is the problem then so uh, and and i think i have nakard the solution saying that you know we at netri which is india's uh, it is being designed as an incubator and an aggregator for women in politics to solve the problem of the political ecosystem it is not only about the parliament it is also when we talk about the effectiveness of women and their representation at the panchayat level but looking at the problem figures that we see in the parliament and in the state legislative legislative assemblies in india uh, we see that the uh, the representation is barely 9% and 14% respectively uh, and and the question arises that you know in 75 years of independence where has it really come uh in 75 years the the growth investment is only 9.3% and anybody who knows like return on investment principles we have not really invested enough on our women uh so that we are getting these kind of growths right uh, it, and we don't have a 100 year to achieve the full, uh, this equity that is being spoken about in so many various reports that you know it will take 130 years or 100 years plus to get to that uh, to get to that parity and the idea is to br- start building our own tables right the idea is saying we don't want to sit at the table anymore let's build a new table together uh which can be designed um in a very inclusive manner but then uh one may say that okay what are women bringing to the table uh essentially the, the, this is uh, ndi one of the leading think tanks based out of the states which is which has worked over 35 years in 100 countries and it has given very concrete understanding of that when women leaders come to power what do they do differently they are definitely more responsive to people there are reports which say that women tend to deliver more more on the manifesto promises compared to their male counterparts similarly they are invested in peace building efforts largely because also women have you know we we go back to the gender debate and see that women have also been a collateral damage usually in the war right how uh how that uh, that was that that experience translates into a motivation to bring people on the peace uh, peace building tables then the third thing is increased public private partnership led projects that is also that we have seen that women are able to bring collaborations together and execute them in the in the, in the manner that you would want to see the ppp is going ahead also the focus on the social policies you you pick education health a uh, maternal health menstrual health like there are various categories to that then there are different kinds of you know social justice schemes women have largely proven um i, I would use the term better in compared to their male counterparts as we say but if this is like really a silver bullet if people know the answer to you know better governance if we can have better leadership then what really are the barriers what are we talking about when we are talking about barriers why are there not enough women in politics so we see that and this is where nadri's work come in when uh, in 
19, the journey is very personal. As a, again, I'll go back to 2018, 19. Looking at the time when I was in a political office, like working with politicians, and, and one would ponder as a 25, 26 year old, oh, what if I want to do politics in this country? Can I be trained into it? Uh, can I be given the networks for it? Who will mentor me? Who will actually handhold? And we know that politics as a as an industry or as a workplace or as a as a profession has been mystified. It has been deliberately made complex. And I have in no qualm in saying that people who centralize power um, do not want to share it with the people who have been at the margins and the peripheries. So it has been made into a very complex system. People don't know how to like put that first step into it. Even if they do that, how are they going to navigate the uh, navigate the field? Then the second question comes: Okay, women have not been able to, uh, you know, make their representation count in politics. What is really stopping them? Is there a systemic fundamental problem why women are not choosing politics, or is they are? What is it that is not enabling their success or survival in politics? Uh, all those questions, um, we we try to answer them in these um, in these uh, challenges. This was this was also a result of the work we did on the ground in four districts in Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh, where we wanted to see if uh, economic uh, power, like you know, e economic engagement or economic opportunities, are translating into agency, like decision decision making agency of women within households but also in the governance system. But we figured out that there are these very specific challenges, the strategic, motivational, resource-based, behavioral, and skill-based challenges, uh, which takes us to saying that what we found as a solution, that Natri's core matrix as a solution is that we do training, resource aggregation, uh, mentorship, and uh, community building for women, and for them to be able to take that leap into politics. But if I have to go back uh, and talk about why these aspects are so important? Because as I said, that there is a lack of access to even knowing what I need to do for politics. So if tomorrow I have to ask any one of you um, and say, can you contest an election tomorrow? What would be your first response? I'm, I'm open to you know hearing anybody uh, yeah, come in. Would anybody want to you know, just take a guess? Uh, any woman in the audience, even men, they might uh, share what, how they feel about politics or if you were given an opportunity or you were just asked to contest, what would be your first response? Kangshi, we've had that conversation between you and you know, uh, between you and me and you know my answer. <laughs> Very you can repeat it for the sake of logistics. the other audience. <laughs> for the logistics. <laughs> Yeah, the logistics of it, right? But uh, that's a great answer because logistics is such a is such a you know a wider umbrella that we can put all the resources or all the you know the the management, the team, all of that under logistics. But if I have to break it down further, um, if I have to say, okay, what do you think also is required for politics? We have largely taken out. So we all right now also focus a lot on the semantics of. Right, what is needed? A campaign team is needed. A constituency needs to be figured out. A party needs to be, you know, uh, I need to align myself with the party. But we have also forgotten what we do politics for. Uh, politics was supposed to be a value-driven ecosystem where the ultimate goal was public service. Uh, now, public service delivery. Right. Um, within that, we also don't know our why. Why we want to be in politics. I think that. You know, that journey of understanding why um, a woman like me would be interested in politics it has to come from, one, a deeper understanding of my own identity, uh, identity, but second, my challenges, the challenges of the community I represent, how much am I embedded in the realities of the grassroots, then I have a very strong drive to drive that change, you know, or, or to implement that change. Um, in that context, I usually say a lot of us will fall, right? All of us understand our identity. We have social capital. We understand our communities a little bit. But at the same time, we have 
for some reason and i don't know where did this happen but you know our grandparents generation was absolutely invested in the political process in this country right they did not take the freedom that we got um and we fought so hard for for granted but there was this generational period where we started losing and engaging losing interest in politics or engaging with it in a meaningful manner not um so this is the generation uh, which needs to reclaim that but more so women because they have even gotten the benefits say of uh, a, a reservation which is well deserved but also so, like supremely important in a context like india um but at the same time their politicization right where where do they need to engage with the system to get their demands met so even if we qualify on the why and the value system we still don't think for some reason politics is not presented as a effective way of getting things done or i would rather join an ngo work with a grassroots organization do advocacy do activism but for some reason politics has been made a dirty play field right coming from that mindset it is also necessary to reclaim the idea of power and how women want to do politics uh, a lot of female role models that we have had in the past one can generalize them or you know paint brush them oh they came from dynasty or they came from privilege or they had so much resources but it is also important to understand that these were women right now also you can you know single handedly hand pick them and be like okay we can talk about an indra gandhi or a pratibha patel or a shima swaraj but we will constantly single them out and single out their experiences and based on which we will keep denying um denying rights or possibilities and opportunities to women saying even women were corrupt or even women did a very uh, say a male centric politics if you look at the very um, machoistic politics that indira gandhi had like she's she's definitely an icon that all of us can look up to but uh, at the same time you see that you know in fact let's talk about an international example like a margaret thatcher uh the kind of politics that they put forth or the kind of personalities in politics that they put forth were very male uh male designed so it is also a space where we want to nurture this ecosystem where what does it really mean to even reclaim a gender gendered politics right where where there is a different kind of leadership say a jacinda ardern is doing uh when she's the uh when she uh, comes at the helm and handles the covid crisis for her country she even does a you know a very very uh casual facebook live from the comfort of her home of her home or she takes a new born to the parliament right and and says that this is the new normal you have to accept women without um how do i say without degendering them right so associations with power also have to change and i think this is the comfort comfort space that we at nature want to create where women can come have the safe space to design their own kind of politics and also say how would i like to be perceived as a leader or what is the kind of politics that i want to do when i'm at the helm of it so this training when it's it's being like conceptualized as a training it's not only the hard skill training the kind of programs that we run and i'll come to them um uh, in a minute but uh, when we say that we have a very strong conviction that we do gender uh, we would want to achieve gender equality through political equity we want to say we want to now change things at the top so that they can see down into the systems better we have seen the uh, you know upward model and we saw that you know the women reservation bill in the parliament has not passed for last 25 years it's it was tabled it was passed in the rajya sabha in 2010 um but then now the bill has definitely lapsed all the political party put it as one of the top agendas when they are contesting election nobody delivers on it right so we consistently see that there is a discomfort in sharing power with the groups that have not had power traditionally and conventionally uh so uh, th- that was another challenge right somebody said that okay there is no women reservation bill what if you even train these women where will they go you know will they be accepted into the system because parties are still giving 8% 9% ticket to women out of like 100 seats that they contest they give 8 8 seats to women so that how that's how bad it is and we are still talking we are talking in 2021 again i want to remind the uh, audience and everybody listening that it is 75 78 years after you know 75 years of independence 
and this is where we are. So are we going to wait around? And hence the idea of mass, uh, you know, a women cadre being prepared, which is not only ready to take office, but is also ready to be the campaigners, the political trainers on the ground, the political organizers, and taking important position within political parties. So another another interesting, uh, you know, facet of Indian politics is that they have women wings, right? They have Mahila Mojas and women wings and all of that. And they recruit women. They have massive, say, recruitment on, on women. And they, they slot them all or compartmentalize them all into the Mahila Congress. Now, or Mahila BJP or Mahila Mocha or Mahila AAP or Mahila, you know, wing. Now, that is the problem, right? Because then you are saying that all of the other departments, which will include, say, minority representation, youth wing, um, media, fisheries, whatever, Will, re- will remain devoid of women because we have placed all the women there. So what? So this is also like, you know, while it is a great spot to enter, right? Women, uh, women wings in uh, political parties are a great entry point for women. But then we also have to build the ecosystem in a manner that they start getting assimilated with the larger political party structures. They, they need not remain slotted in those. So uh, we are very, very focused on developing uh, these um, uh, ecosystems. And that is why we have two kinds of program. One is Pathways to Politics, uh, where we essentially uh, help women gain some hard skills into politics. Um, And I'll stop sharing also. I just want to uh, talk to the audience and I'll go back to sharing if I have to. But uh, the Pathways to Politics is a program where we do hard skills for politics. Like it's some... Uh, four to six week program where they learn technology, social media, boot management, fundraising, all of uh, those, uh, you know, hard skills for politics, but also understanding identity and intersectionality with political communication and narratives. The Samantha Ambassador program is where we have experimented and have, we have gotten wonderful response. It is, it is also an experiment that came out of women's needs which was when women were coming in our programs and in the partnership program that we were doing, we heard women saying, oh, but we can't immediately take a plunge into politics. Tomorrow, I can't decide I want to contest this assembly election. So one, what is a good way? So always, we, you know, we promote that, you know, the best way to get into politics is through the grassroots, go to the PRIs, do the urban local body elections. But at the same time, we're like, okay, even that will take some momentum. We have just got introduced to this idea and we really want to take it further. But what do we do in the meantime? So Samantha is the, uh, the Samantha ambassador. Samantha in Hindi means, uh, like in English, it would mean equality, equity. Uh, these are ambassadors of change. We are saying that we, they will be able to go and train other women who are already, say, at the gram panchayat level. They are already the right contenders for a certain ticket or they have already made up their mind that they are going to contest. So these women, we train them to become the Samantha ambassadors with organizational skills, with campaign skills, with social campaign skills. Um, again, some hard skills are interspersed here and there. Uh, for example, boot management is something very important for them to know, but also locating the politics of the lay of the land and helping women contest and identifying their needs. So that's a kind of a skill set that we have also brought in. Now, both the programs in future, we are conceptualizing a specific incubator uh, where women can deep dive into their political careers. Um, Now, all of this work um, requires, as I keep saying, that there is ongoing research in understanding women's aspiration and what comes in between. We did a report called Muscle Money Misogyny, (laughs) uh, the three big M's that come in the way of women in entire South Asia. So it's a South Asia and study that we have done and conducted. So these are the problems that we cannot solve alone. So Nadri's approach henceforth is to build that ecosystem where we make politics one viable in the short term and aspirational um, alongside with the value system, right? So it's like, how can you get into it by being in different political offices, doing political management, doing some campaign work, making it sustainable in the short run, and also making it a very explorable field because right now uh, and this is a this is a very basic moral dilemma that i've faced that you know how can you ask women who are sliding down on economic scale they don't have so many economic opportunities 
Uh, so look at the two figures together, right? The women's lab labor force participation is going down and we want their political participation to increase. But we know that the political system is marred with a lot of money. You have the, 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 the official figures of the last general elections were close to 60,000 crores. Um, it's, it's such a, a capital intensive place. Women don't inherit property. Women are anyway paid lesser in any job that they take in any sector. Then their participation in labor is going down. Then how do you expect women to do, uh, you know, elections? That's a, that's a moral dilemma, right? Not even a moral, that's a fundamental dilemma that how do you then uh, sieve through women who are in a position to take up politics? And we don't want politics to be such a exclusive, uh, you know, domain of work where only the rich can get into. That's such a problem. And not only for women, it is also a problem for men. Uh, sometimes women still have a better narrative um, and that they can, you know, win and connect with people sometimes far better than men do. Uh, they might have an edge, but totally, they, you know, in terms of women's, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, at Nature, we're also trying to look at these uh, research figures on how women's campaigns are done at such lower price sometimes. If you want to compare the amount of money that men spend on a campaign versus what women spend. So all those are dilemmas, but they're also, so that is why we want to make politics sustainable, right? We want them to be able to dabble a feet into something which is considered dangerous, dirty, unsustainable, and uncertain. We want them to dabble a feet into it and whatever this, you know, political management systems have done with capitalization of whole political ecosystem in India, it has at least given some opportunity for women to become campaigners for other people on a certain cost. They can become social media in charges of these other people and see whether or not I want to get into it. Another principle that we always talk about at Netri is don't ask anybody to do what you won't do yourself, right? Especially something like politics. So if somebody says, Kangshi, will you do politics? Um, you know, if life had a different plan for me, maybe yes. Uh, but this is my plan as of now. And I, I think this is my way of doing politics. But certainly, this is political for me. This is very personal and political for me. So don't, so I think this is also a great, you know, a point of, uh, the point of, uh, you know, pondering. People, people get into a thought mode. Yes, we should definitely, you know, help other people contest and see whether or not, you know, they're able to do it and then, you know, implement it on yourself. Things like that. Another, another core principle is to have these, again, as I keep going, keep going back to is the non-partisanship. One may say that I don't identify a certain, with a certain kind of politics, uh, but at the same time, and I, I might have my own political opinions, but they don't seep into a place like Nathalie because my fundamental politics is that I believe personal is political. So I cannot tell a woman which party to choose, which, uh, you know, which, which party should she align with. I can tell her that you should totally be aligned with the constitution. And that is the politics that we are looking at, the, the politics of the constitution. Uh, if till the last, uh, you know, till the last nail that you can keep, uh, you know, put in your coffin, if you're going to stand by and protect the constitutional values, doesn't matter which party you're aligning with. It I know this can be a very, you know, apolitical statement, which I'm not at all. Uh, but this is also to say that, you know, there is a spirit to keep the non-partisanship going. Also why we will never be able to say that yehi party or this party is going to, you know, keep getting in power. We need good women across and good, I mean, like good is a very subjective word. We need assertive, good, like, or, or I'll say replicable inspiring role models in women leadership who bring about gender policy transformation across party lines because parties are going to come and come and go uh, it is the leaders who are going to leave the legacy behind right um we are at this point in time we are able to read the, the legacy of uh, different people right from an ambedkar uh, to bhagat singh to bose to gandhi to nehru as different leaders uh, despite wherever, whatever faction of politics that they were coming from. So legacies are to be left by people themselves, uh, wherever they align themselves. So these are a few of the, you know, um, thoughts and the work that we have done so far. One of the things that I would love to share, and this is something about our 
um, our amazing uh, alumni. And I want to just quickly pull up their, you know, their photos. Uh, one of them, and this is such an inspiring story, I always um, uh, tell Archil, and Archil is somebody from uh, Delhi. Uh, you see this girl in the middle. Um, in 20, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was 20, uh, it was last year, yes. And I receive an email on our Native Foundation email saying, I want to become a politician now. And it was, it was like so inspiring. She wrote a long email saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. She spent so, such a long time in the, uh, in the development sector. Uh, she identifies uh, with her uh, caste, which is like she's a Dalit and she wants to work with their rights. Um, intersectionality that she brought and she saw Artishi on one of our platforms and she's like I just saw this video I think I want to do politics you tell me how that's that's how naive and simple you have to be if you want to take a plunge in politics like one one would say you have to grow a thick skin that is later you have to be absolutely naive uh like hopeless optimist <laughs> which is like I am going to do this because if we start thinking too much about our challenges in the beginning I think Anshal's story is a great story in that naivety, but that passion and conviction in saying, I really want to plunge in. Right now, she's preparing to contest in Delhi. And I hope that happens because, you know, th these conversations, whenever I have with her, they go in so many directions, you know, how to manage the politics of the party, how to go and manage the constitute, you know, the, uh, the, the politics of the constituency. All of those are, all of those are a struggle. Maybe... May, she's preparing to contest, but we really don't know. And this uncertainty lies there, right? How will it pan out for you? So that kind of strategy is also something that one has to integrate when doing politics. Um, then we have like these other amazing people who have graduated from Nepri's program and they have taken very, very inspiring positions. Uh, it, it might seem small to some people, but to just take that plunge. So Sujita enrolled in one of our programs. Um, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, Sujita enrolled in our program, and within like say two, three weeks of completing that program, she was offered a position in a political party as the spokesperson in Tamil Nadu. You see, um, uh, Priyanka. Priyanka is going to be contesting in Bihar uh, in the in the in the Mukhya election as a Mukhya. You see, Maria. Maria is another very young girl who's like, I really want to. She she kept on texting me on Instagram initially and said. I really want to do something with Nethi. This is how I want to start my career, et cetera, et cetera. And right now she became the advisor to the deputy advisor, uh, to the advisor of the deputy CM of uh, Delhi. So these are very, very inspiring. And like these, these are the women who have actually plunged into action after they came to our program, which is where the inspiration to do this more comes from. In the past, we have already partnered with quite a few organizations. We, we host women political figures, even men, uh, good, uh, you know, these like uh, inspiring feminist, um, gender align, uh, aligning men into our conversations uh, to come in as faculties. But uh, also another thing that I, I personally believe in very strongly is that we really need to give practitioner viewpoint on the trainings that we do. So this has largely been the area of work. And I've been speaking for last, I don't know, 30 minutes and I want to really pause uh, and open it up either for questions or, you know, if there is, if we can, yeah. If there's anything that I really need to clarify at this point um, and if there are questions, there are thoughts that we can take. Otherwise I have more stuff to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Kangshi. Uh, I know you personally, full admission, and I know that your enthusiasm and your passion is infectious. Like, I start talking about, like, I am generally a pessimist, but then, like, when I'm in your company, I become a hopeless optimist. Like, I jump from one extreme to the other. Anyways, hmm. so, uh, yeah, we shall now open up uh, the session to the Q&A, and uh, this uh, is also streaming live on YouTube, so we'll be picking up questions from there in the chat box as well, if there are any. Uh, please keep the questions uh, brief and to the point. Any more queries can be uh, mailed to fiveelements.sdg at the gmail.com. So I'd like to start with a question. Uh, talk about the electability argument that is often given uh, to actually ditch, like to dish women, basically. 
So yeah. uh, I was uh, working for Dr. S. Y. Kureish, who is the former Chief Election Commissioner, and uh, we actually wrote a paper together, actually debunking the myth of electability of women. So the hit rate of uh, talk about the hit rate of women compared to the women uh, like the money that has been spent and the tickets that have been given to them. Yeah, I'm trying to pull uh, the you know I know I can talk factually. I'm just trying to uh, pull the figures that I have with me uh, a, a you know a, a chart which shows right from the first election down to 2014 and 2019 also. I don't know if I have the 2019 figures. um every time in each and every election how winability is calculated let's let's look at that okay um one there are less a number of women contesting so if there are 100 men contesting there are only say 10 women contesting right out of that 10 women the electability so you know you would see that out of 100 50 men will not win you know all those 50 men will not win but out of this 10 women six women will win and that is how if you like look at 6 on 10 that gives 60% winability versus uh say 30 men won so that gives 30% of winability there essentially saying that each time the number of women who are contesting and the number who actually come out with like winning with flying colors uh is higher when it is compared within the within the segment of the gender that is the way winability is largely looked at but there is another um which is intangible factor which is not usually captured which is how women and youth both are allocated very tough seats uh first timers uh women uh and young people both are given toughest seats and despite that if you want to overlap data then there are swing seats of a party then there are these you know red seats and green seats one that you are going to comfortably win this is a swing seat this is a you know swing seats are usually on the border on the margin yahan pe bhi jata hai wahan pe bhi jata hai whatever and then there are these red seats women are usually um given and this is uh, this is something that is anecdotal mostly and i'm i'm not sure if there is a research that overlaps and says uh waise bhi kam ticket dete ho you only give 8% 9% tickets and then you give tough seats and then women come out with flying colors like you know women are definitely working twice hard as men <laughs> so uh that is that is you know this idea that women are not winnable second if at all they are not winnable i really think that there is a role of the media and i'll give you a uh, study that done by nwmi which talks about how when in during a national election uh between modi ajriwal and rahul gandhi you would know where the time distribution of the media space was going but there were out of 10 if you look, look at 10 massive leaders there were only three women okay one of them being mamta one of was one of them was sonia the third was pgv she was not even like priyanka gandhi vatra she was not even fighting an election and she was giving the time she was given the time and the space on the national media during a election that is happening in the country which essentially uh, and they were giving given less than 10% of the time the 90% time goes to the seven men three women only three women and then they get 10% or 12% time now even within that the argument is that only certain few women like even within the women category only certain few women get that kind of national media and the focus on their campaigns we see a major responsibility of the media to not even cover sensitively the women candidates who are contesting in local elections they're like how wo jo wo narrative hai the narrative at the ground is that somebody's wife is contesting and media perpet like uh, sorry perpetuates that narrative right sometimes like we media does not know how know how to do gender sensitive political reporting when they go and interview a sarpanches if the sarpanch pati comes and says i am the sarpanch how many media persons go and say no i really want to talk to the person uh, to the sarpanch being a sarpanch pati is like you know that's um, 
uh, mostly uh, appropriation or you know impersonification actually not appropriation impersonification of a public official it should be a crime you should be punishing people but our media our government systems our bureaucracy has legitimized that position that people started putting a tag on their proud sarpanchpati sarpanchpati essentially means the husband of the and, and that became a post it's unconstitutional it's legally um you know it 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 can have a legal repercussion uh these are the problems right so when you talk about electability i think there is a lot of lot to do with the perception that the media is spreading because people are still voting we see that you know these women have won and then there is a question of dynasty if you ever want to ask me that i'll i'll have some things to do, talk about that as well yeah go ahead talk to like so i mean, I mean if, uh, okay so i open it uh, to the uh, audience uh, would you uh, would anyone like to ask anything more than welcome to unmute yes i don't go ahead yeah uh, thank you shivanshi for hosting thanks kangshi for being a, a guest today uh, it's been uh, riveting and i've enjoyed every word that you've spoken uh, the question uh, i have is uh, perhaps it's even two questions number one where do you find the candidates who are the women that you target how do you get to them uh, that's one part of the question and the other part is Uh, how is leadership in politics related to leadership in society it could be home could be company could be an association or a society or an ngo whatever uh, but uh, how how do they interplay positions of leadership in the broader society and specific roles in politics wonderful questions both of them and i would first take the second question and come to the uh, other one um essentially um when we look at the ideas of leadership they change and i think there is no set model of what should be a good leader but then there, there there are certain aspects and virtues we all associate with leadership uh and i think all of this would have really play, played a wonderful role uh that you know uh, corporate leaders in so, like society leaders somebody like even an rwa president is a very good candidate rwa means Re- uh, resident welfare association for uh, uh, sorry for my abbreviation uh, even those people who like take leadership in society uh, they are community leaders all of this would have been wonderful if we did do not um depoliticize ourselves in last few years what has essentially happened is people started owning the tag of being a political up their sleeve is they dissociated themselves with the politics that they do in and out of just existing our politics is of existence right and lot of people for them really the politics is of existence the tribal communities the way they are being wiped out in different parts of the country or the kind of you know struggle power struggle has happened i think these leaderships that you speak about in society at large would be a great pipeline if we started owning politics up our sleeve and say i have led 20 years of a wonderful career in a corporate now i want to plunge into politics that because even when i was in a certain corporate career say i was a bank ceo or a bank vp or i was in uh, asset management or private private equity i knew that even there i asserted some kind of politics i uh, i i believed in certain principles and i made sure that they were not being nominally or token in in name of tokenism being done i really wore my politics up my sleeve and this is an example of that so i think the politics it's a very narrow word that you have started understanding as the power struggle between two people like we, we say office politics you know happens everywhere it is not about that it is the politics of a corporation some uh, right now i think which country is this but i think it's australia i am not sure but they have a campaign it's a citizen led campaign i think which is ongoing where they have put up posters of how hsbc is funding the adani's project in getting the oil uh, or you know in in the mining, 
yeah, the mining, yeah, they are funding mining. So they have actually made a mass campaign where bus stops and most, you know, public spaces are plastered with HSBC cares about you, they're funding mining, you know. So how they are, the citizens are owning that kind of a movement. That is wonderful to see. Uh, I just came across it a few days ago and I was like, wow. Um, I think, yeah, so this is, this is something to say that the citizens know which corporations are creating a problem. Similarly, corporations also very strategically stepping away from some associations and saying, I will not do business with somebody who is into, say, tanning of leather. Or I will not do business with somebody who is into deforestation. That is the kind of politics one talks about. And if there were leaders who were helming that kind of decision, those are the leaders, the Homi Bhabas and the, you know, JRD Tatas of the world at that time, right? Uh, they were never into politics, but they shaped a certain thinking. And as society leaders, I think they contributed a lot to politics. With Nehru, uh, we were in chess together. That is the land that was, you know, uh, given as a, uh, I think the Kapoors, the Raj Kapoors uh, gave that land and Homi Bhabha, Ratan Tata uh, and Nehru had that discussion that let's put a PIFR and a test together. Those are the kind of discussions that we are looking at. So that is the second part of the question. But the first part, I will not lie. I will not say that it's a paint, you know, it's a rosy picture. Netri-like organizations and there are other organizations, we are trying to create a new market for being interested in getting trained in politics. Right now, that is not even a like concept, right? One would say, I get, can get training for becoming a doctor, teacher, pilot, chef, everything, but not a politician. It's the creation of a new market. And we look at organizations. So one of our strategies is to get people with certain kind of social capital who have done enough social, you know, uh, social work, or they come with a certain kind of social capital can be both from experience side, from connections and network side, but how have they utilized their work uh, and social net network uh, into creating that, uh, that value in the society? That is one thing. And how we do that is we do a lot of organic uh, social media reach, but partnering with grassroots organization. Uh, partnering with, so in Tamil Nadu, when we did our Pathways to Politics, so we have two programs reiterating Pathways to Politics and Samantha Ambassador. When we were doing Pathways to Politics, we always do it before state assembly elections. Um, and uh, during that, we partnered with a local, out, local organization, which has been working with women, a women's collective. Um, uh, then there was another organization that has been working on women's right. We partnered with them and said, why don't you nominate some women? You identify, you know the ground better sometimes. And that is why also Netri believes a lot. And we, we are very, very happy to, to create more people who want to do Netri like things. That is where the Samantha ambassadors also come in. There's a wonderful participant who came in that program, is now uh she had already she already had that idea, but she's now an alumni and she wants to do Netri uh like things, but our target audience is very different. She's like, I want to demystify politics for young girls. So she's taking it even a notch up, right? And she's like, let's catch them young in the positive way. So these are the ways that we have been identifying participants, but going ahead to keep identifying them, to keep nurturing them is a challenge unless um, unless social organizations or people who have worked with SFGs, SFGs was my first ground, by the way. We looked at SSGs in uh, Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh and went ahead and said, women who have some political, uh, some economic, um, you know, capital, or they, they understand a little bit economics, they their political transformation can happen sooner. So we are looking at some social economic capital, uh, not really economic in the sense, we are not looking at crore women, <laughs> but uh, we are looking at women who understands uh, economics, you know, their own economic agency, yeah. So we have a question from Mr. Johnson. Uh, shouldn't going into politics be based more on one's motivations and interests rather than mentorship? This must be a question you might be getting a lot, Kangshi, I guess. Yeah. No, but, uh, but why is that in, is an honor? Uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you for that question. Uh, one's motivations and uh, I think all of us and the age and the times that we live in, we are motivated people. We are convinced people. But uh, there are downs, right? There are these crests and troughs. The, 
the troughs is where you need mentorship where you are actually feeling lost and it is as i keep going back to the question of um uh, that how it has been mystified or it has been deliberately compacted or centralized that it's very hard to navigate that way in so right now i might be motivated but what do i do we really don't know what to do in politics like tomorrow i want to contest what do i where do i even i right now if i have to start my strategy or if i have to contest tomorrow oh my god my first thing will be i need this also this also this also this also but which one do i need first so something like social entrepreneurship i have to do all of the work together right uh, i have to put the program together but i also have to think about fundraising all of that similarly a politician has to have all the resources coming together so the mentorship comes in during the troughs when you really when you are when you are confused when you need a way ahead i i would think it is even more than that uh look at education training whatever we go through i may be motivated to be an engineer a doctor a pilot but there is a four year program a five year program a six year program to get me there okay uh, so uh, i think uh, it's 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 one and the other uh, of course you need the motivation the will the desire uh, but then how do you inculcate the capabilities the skills that it requires that's one thing uh, the other thing which is for me important in leadership for sustainable development there are a lot of people who want to do social business and yes they get into it they don't know what their blind spots are they don't know where their strengths lie and where their weaknesses are so the same mentorship that any leader goes through in the corporate world or social development sector or whatever you do need that mentorship and possibly much more of that uh, because of the other traps the other hurdles in politics right thank you for substantiating that with those uh, insights and remarks question from shama uh, who says that what support or retraining to women in positions like dynastical women uh, miss sonia and miss priyanka require in your opinion and experience so basically i mean should they step aside so that other women leaders can lead for impact uh thank you for that question shama and i think um, there is space for everyone you know this is another very um, i would say a very capitalistic idea or a very um uh, male dominated idea that you know women only get a piece of the pie and then all of the women are fighting for that pie the entire pie is ours um uh, there is so much space for everybody in this democracy uh, there are so many constituencies um even if they step aside they are not do- they are not the ones doing the harm right in the sense that they step aside but is there a pathway for the other woman to climb up and be there the idea we are not concerned about who is at the top right now we are saying that can we build that sustainable pathway so tomorrow if sonia and and even if they step aside they are not going to be there forever right um they don't step aside today they don't they are not immortal human beings um uh, but will that be replicated we couldn't replicate an indira gandhi i don't know if we wanted to or not but there was no no succession to that right there was an amma uh, jailalita in in tamil nadu we couldn't replicate that so we have actually not created the pipeline so nathi's work and i don't think my my botheration is with the people already in the system my botheration is how to get these new women who have an aspiration and the value system to bring about the change they will replace it's the people's choice uh, if if you have the right candidates if they are prepared they're sharp people know what to choose so i hope that answers yeah so uh, just uh, for everyone's kind information uh, kangshi has posted a fundraiser for our organization so please do check it out uh, so uh, i mean i i would like to extend that question you were talking about um, i mean the piece of the pie and expanding the piece of the pie what about electoral systems and what reform we need there to enable women because uh, in whatever background reading that i have done in my limited experience which is actually very limited um it's like electoral systems uh, like fptp actually push people out marginalize people out and they are very uh, majoritarian in nature and uh, we are essentially just fighting for crumbs right yeah. in procrastia so uh, like what about a nepal which has introduced a mixed system of pro- proportional representation as well as a 
PTP. Um, and what about expanding the existing seats in parliament and who gets those expanding seats? So then the history is not repeated. So, and uh, like the first thing is about electoral system. The second is about electoral reform. So money, media, and mafia. So money essentially guides media and mafia. So uh, what about money in politics? And uh, like, do we need to do something about that, which has a direct correlation with women's representation? Absolutely. Both your questions are so valid. I think you've also partly answered them in your questions, right? Uh, the, F the first past the post system is FTP. Uh, F FT FPTP. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> First past the post system and the proportional representation. Of course, uh, Shivanshi, you also know that uh, exactly. Forget about these electoral reforms, uh, uh, electoral reforms and electoral system changes, because electoral reform we got the reform that we got the electoral bonds, right? Yeah. <laughs> what we were trying to uh, make the system more transparent in the pursuit of which we have made the system more opaque by getting electoral bonds. That was very recent, like, I don't think 2017, 18, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Around that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know where we are heading with that. Second, with the electoral system change, what are we even asking about uh, when we don't even pass the women reservation bill? So but changing the entire election, uh, you know, mechanism of from first past the post representation system to, uh, yeah, uh, to uh, proportional representation, um, we are not even passing a bill which gives 33% reservation to women in parliament and, uh, and legislative assemblies. So we're talking about system that does not want to change because it is it is it works for them. People who don't want the system to change is are the people who it works for. So we have to somehow figure out a strategy. And I'm right now when you say that you know the and I was also saying that money has seeped so much into political management. But okay, thank God for it that right now women have one new stream of career where they can start dabbling into politics. It's opened an opportunity if you want to see it like that. Second, uh, let's make whatever this system is, let's make it work for women. If more women will start contesting, there will be more opportunities for more women. They will be saying, I want a female chief of staff. I want a female campaigner. And Netri is actually looking at that ecosystem. For, for us, an elected Netri is as good as and not like greater to a woman uh, like a Netri campaigner or a Netri uh, party position holder or a Netri trainer or a Netri organizer because we think that it is an ecosystem um, and when one woman takes office, she'll take it with the tribe. So uh, what, you know, that's that's another motto that I have. Um, but uh, thank you for those questions. And I've, as I said that, uh, funding um, uh, is like fundraising for something like political. We don't rely on foreign funds. Uh, we are recently incubated at IIM Bangalore. But to support an initiative like that, we can't ask women to, you know, mostly pay up for the program. Uh, so we really rely on humble support from people. Uh, and I've shared the fundraiser link. Would be very, very thankful if you can, you know, contribute any small, any small amount. Nothing is small in this, in this big pool of, bringing about one Netri at a time in the ecosystem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kangshi. Uh, with this, we come to the end of this uh, webinar, Bridging Gender Gap One Netri at a Time. Uh, it was a privilege to uh, actually interact with you and bring you on. Uh, and I would like to thank you, uh, Kangshi, on behalf of the entire team uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to actually join us and to enlighten us of the work uh, that you're doing uh, it's really important i believe considering the state we are in uh, politically uh, we are also very grateful for our enthusiastic participants for their curiosity and enthusiasm in making this a unique learning experience uh, any more questions uh, can be re uh, redirected to us at fiveelements.sdg at the gmail.com you can also uh, direct message kangshi on linkedin facebook instagram she's everywhere so you can contact her in case you're interested in her programs um, our socials are also up on the screen. Um, just a moment. Oh, sweet. Thank you so much for hosting me, Shivanshi. And thank you, uh, Mr. Arun. It was a pleasure meeting you. And I would love, love to think, uh, think through this again with you uh, and discuss this further. I hope. Uh, please come back next month as we explore yet another issue with the lens of gender justice. Our social media handles are up on the screen and we look forward to your further comments and queries. Please feel free to write to us. Thank you. Uh, stay safe out there and goodbye.
Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Kanshi. I have made some notes for follow-up and yes, we need to have a follow-up meeting with you. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you so much, Mr. Arun. Wonderful.